down in Florida tried to win the last time around. And uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to commit a uh, $500 donation to you. Wow. And I spare even a dollar. That's one more dollar that will help him uh, because he needs this money right now to uh, have the resources to win in November. So anyone who's watching right now, anyone who is uh, here right now that has a spare buck, please go to TimPenwilda.com and support Tim uh, and help him out and uh, make sure that we are sending people like Tim to Congress this November. In, uh, every part of the country, wherever you are from. Make sure it's a progressive choice and not someone that thinks they are progressive. <laughs> Thank you.
team out against the team fit. Okay. Well, the long and short of it is, I, I hooked up with folks from the Citizens Trade Campaign. Uh, we lobbied, they were lobbying the entire Florida delegation against the TPP. And at the end of the day, Debbie Wasserman Schultz was the only representative in the House delegation, only, I should say, the only Democrat in Florida's House delegation to vote to fast track the TPP. And we started to talk to each other. We've got to find somebody to challenge her. She's got a safe district. It's good gerrymandered for her. And if there's no primary challenge, there's not really any democracy here whatsoever. There's no accountability. And we started to research her background. She took $330,000 from big corporate interests that wanted the TPP. And we kept researching her background. And we saw she's taken millions of dollars from big Wall Street banks, private health insurance companies, private prisons, the fossil fuel industry, the list goes on and on. So we start rolling up our sleeves, looking for folks in Florida politics who maybe will challenge her, state representatives, local mayors. We couldn't find anybody. And of course, that's because she was the head of the DNC. Well, at the same time, there's Bernie Sanders running for president, calling on all of us to step up and to start running for office, to start doing all kinds of things outside of our comfort zone. And I'll say running for office was way outside of my comfort zone. Yep. And my friends in the Citizens Trade Campaign start putting the bug in my ear, telling me, saying, Tim, you're the one. You've got to step up and challenge. Bless you. Bless you. The turning point for me was when Debbie Wasserman Schultz used her DNC to try to, bless you, thank you. Use the DNC to try to block Bernie Sanders' campaign from access to the Van Voter database. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you could say, the proverbial last straw. We jumped into the race in early 2017. A lot of folks were saying that's too late to, to mount a primary challenge, less than eight months before the primary. But I'll tell you, I saw what the grassroots was doing, what we were doing for Bernie Sanders' campaign, and I had complete faith that the grassroots would be there for me. Not because I was a perfect candidate, but because who I was running against. Okay? We ran a great campaign thanks to all of your help. We raised a lot of money, all in small donations online, and I plowed that money back into the field. We opened four field offices in one district. We had between field organizers, deputy field organizers, and volunteers, we had two to three hundred people knocking on doors every day in the Florida heat. We were knocking on 10 to 12,000 doors a day. I think this was probably the biggest ground game of any campaign, any congressional district in the country in 2016. Now, we fell short on election day, and it always seemed a little strange to us because our field numbers showed us pulling away at the end. It took a while to, you could say, recover, and a couple of months after the election, I put in a ballot request. Uh, I should say, a public records request to inspect the ballots in our race. And as a citizen in Florida, every citizen has the right to inspect ballots under the public records law. I didn't think this, this was going to be very difficult. I had a, a number of election experts that had been contacting me almost every day and every week telling me that their analysis of the results showed a very different result than the official results. So I figured, let's do this public records request, let's inspect the ballots, if it matches up, we can put this issue behind us. Well, we never even got to the point of inspecting the ballots, as many of you probably know. Uh, the supervisor of elections in Broward County stonewalled us for half a year. I brought a lawsuit in June of 2017. While the lawsuit was pending, the supervisor of elections destroyed all of our paper ballots in violation of federal law, state law, and destruction of evidence in an ongoing litigation. Now, this is not just me telling you this. We had a lawsuit going, we took videotape deposition, we released those videotapes to the public, it shows the supervisor of elections admitting to what she did. May 11th of this year, the Florida Circuit Court granted a summary judgment. Any of you lawyers out there, anyone knows, summary judgment is very difficult to win on, and we did. This was an open and shut case, the supervisor had no defense, Really, the only question is, 
who would commit felonies to destroy paper ballots and for what reason? Democrats. Okay. What crime, what crime are they covering up? Obviously, there needs to be a criminal investigation. We were fully hoping and expecting that when we won our case, law enforcement would come and start investigating. That hasn't happened. And that says everything about our political system right now. We have a Republican governor, Rick Scott. He hasn't fired the supervisor. He hasn't suspended her. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement, in Republican hands, has not been investigating. The US Justice Department, the US Attorney, not investigating. These are Republicans. Why wouldn't Republicans want to investigate a Democratic election scandal? And I start asking these questions to a Republican lawyer who's well connected. He gets back to me a couple of weeks later with his findings. He tells me the reason the Republicans are not investigating is they've got the same friends as Debbie Wasserman Schultz. <laughs> I said, what do you mean the same friends? Well, I said, do you mean Florida Power and Light? Do you mean the big sugar companies, the predatory payday lenders? He says, no, no, no. I just mean the, the lobbyists. I said, who do you think those corporate lobbyists represent? He said, of course. It's the same interests. So this starts looking like one party. You know, it, one half of it is blue, the other half is, is red. But underneath, it's all green, the color of money. And that money is stronger than any other kind of ties, affiliations, ideological commitments. And this is only one scandal that Debbie Wasserman Schultz has evaded accountability. There have been others that have been buried by the US Justice Department in recent weeks. So it's been very frustrating. And I must say, so frustrating that it makes me wonder obviously what everyone's wondering. Did we beat her in August of 2016? How did they steal the vote if they did? And is that why they destroyed the ballots? And if that is what happened, what's preventing them from doing it again? How do we get up in the morning and out of bed every day and keep campaigning knowing that they can steal the election the same exact way, destroy the ballots and there's no accountability? It's kept me up at night. Well, I, I was happy to announce just days ago, I was on the Jimmy Dore show, we talked about it. Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy Dore has more integrity in his pinky than most of the American mass media has. Okay. The late John Kenneth Galbraith said that the role of the mass media is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Unfortunately, today, the mass media afflicts the afflicted and comforts the comfortable. This is upside down. It's asked backwards. Well, when I was on Jimmy Dore, I announced that we are talking to folks, we're working with a group called Democracy Counts. Democracy Counts is developing the software to do a citizen's audit. So what we propose to do in November of this year on, on Election Day is to recruit a big army of volunteers train them to be auditors, to use their smartphones, and to have the app developed by Democracy Counts so that we can do our own exit interviews on a massive scale. It won't be just, um, what do they call it, an exit poll. It will be a full-blown audit where our intent is to get 100% of the folks leaving the election booths after they vote to respond to our audit and to do it in a way that includes an affidavit part of it that's admiss admissible in court. We're hoping to raise $200,000 for this. We've got a long way to go. They've raised less than 10,000 so far, but we have just begun to raise the money for this. When we raise the money, we're hoping that this democracy count audit will one, deter any voter election fraud, and two, if there is any election fraud, we'll be able to detect it and do something about it. So I'm urging everybody, go to Democracy Counts GoFundMe page and start opening up your wallets. Folks who are watching this online, on social media, we need the resources. Now, 
I'll say I'm not the perfect candidate. There is no perfect candidate. If you want to find a perfect candidate, somebody you agree with 100% of the time, run for office. <laughs> I don't pretend to be the perfect candidate, but I will say, I won't take a penny of corporate money from any corporate interest. It has been 31 months straight now that I have been in hot pursuit of the criminal Debbie Wasserman. 31 straight months without a vacation. I'm tired, and I'll rest when we get to November. Right. So, what can I tell you about this hot pursuit? We're not giving up. We're going after her on all the issues. We'll have time to discuss the issues of Q&A. This is still probably the most important race in the country. I know it's important to flip the Congress, the House, and the Senate from Republican to Democrat. But this race that I'm in right now says a lot about the future of the Democratic Party, says a lot about the future of our democracy. There are folks who have tried to call me a spoiler, and it's interesting to see where the opposition to me comes from, from both sides. From the establishment, they try to say, now Canova's running as an independent. Tim Canova is an opportunist. Yeah, I saw an opportunity to so, derail sorry. my career as a tenured law <laughs> professor. <laughs> this fall, I will be on the second of three, I'm sorry, the second unpaid leave of absence in three years. That's what my employer, even though I have tenure, that's what they've deemed I must do. So I seized on the opportunity to destroy my income, <laughs> run down my life savings, take on a big establishment, put myself under a lot of stress, so, folks are calling me an opportunist. And now, that opportunist is running as an independent. He's going to end up getting a Republican elected. This is what they're saying. He's working for the Republicans. You know, that's almost as bad as working for Vladimir Putin, I guess. <laughs> Let me tell you something about this district. It was gerrymandered by Debbie Wasserman Schultz for Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And that means it doesn't have a lot of Republicans. 25% of the registered voters in my district are Republicans. Which mean, and the rest are split almost evenly now between Democrats and Independents. Mm -hmm. At the time they gerrymandered this district for Wasserman Schultz, there weren't so many Independents. Uh -oh. You know, they, they try to keep bringing up the ghost of Ralph Nader and say, you know, Tim Canova's Ralph Nader, but without the hair. You know? <laughs> They're forgetting a few things. First of all, for every Democrat who defected to vote for Ralph Nader in 2000, 12 Democrats in Florida defected to vote for George W. Bush. Right. The studies show that if Ralph Nader hadn't been on the ballot, George W. Bush would have won Florida by more votes, not less. Yeah. Not yeah. less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It also ignores exactly what I'm saying. That in this district, because of the demographics, it's hard for a Republican to even take second in a three-way race, let alone first. We're not spoilers. We're in this to win. We're running against a spoiler. Debbie Wasserman Schultz has spoiled the Democratic Party and spoiled our democracy. Yeah. Yeah. I hear progressives that say I'm not the perfect candidate. Progressives that haven't gotten behind us since 2016. 2016 was an exciting year. In May of 2016, I got a call out of the blue telling me that Bernie Sanders had endorsed me. That was an endorsement I didn't go looking for because I didn't think it was even possible. I didn't imagine that Bernie Sanders could endorse somebody challenging the head of the DNC without basically having to deal with the wrath of the Democratic establishment. Well, I think he got the wrath of that establishment and had to back down. And he's backed down ever since. And the rest of the progressive establishment, perhaps they've gotten that memo to stay away from Florida's 23rd Congressional District. Okay. And they've made a lot of excuses. I've heard that Canova didn't win the race because he didn't do the hard work that was needed. He didn't go out there and knock door to door. Now I told you the statistics. 10 to 12,000 doors a week we knocked on. 
We did the hard work, which is why we probably won this race to begin with. So I hear you. You know, you could disagree with me on certain issues or on the way that I've run the campaign, but put me right up against Debbie Wasserman and Schultz. This should be a no-brainer and no contest. And we've had a lot of important primaries this year. Progressives have had a lot of tough losses. A lot of those primaries are behind us. We've got some key ones coming up in New York, and I hope I can help folks, insurgents who are running against establishment candidates in the September primaries. But a lot of these primaries are behind us, and we're gonna to get to a general election. I want everybody to keep their eyes on Florida's 23rd Congressional District. We got less than 100 days to go. I will be out there every day, myself knocking on doors, myself in the line of fire. I can't tell you how many times I've been hit from the front, from the press, corporate funded, corporate owned press, and we've got a few wounds in the back as well from folks we thought were our supporters. I want to say a few words about the media. Last time, last campaign, we raised $3.8 million from 209,000 individual contributions of $17 each. <laughs> what I'm most proud of is that we stayed by our pledge not to take any corporate money. And Huffington Post wrote an article. They said that our campaign broke all records in American political history for the highest percentage of small donations to find this $200 or less raised online. 76% of our contributions were $200 or less online. So. Somebody, earlier, earlier this evening, somebody said, what are you gonna do your first day in office? Are you gonna change when you're in office? Are you gonna start representing your donors like all these other members of Congress who are owned? I said, you bet your ass. You bet your ass. I am going to represent my donors. When I'm elected, I'll be bought and paid for by the American people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, we'll be the only independent or the first independent in the U.S. House of Representatives. Yep. Yeah. Now, I brought up the fundraising in the context of the mass media. A lot of the reason we were able to raise that kind of money last time, and we raised a million dollars in small donations before Bernie ever endorsed me. The reason we were able to raise that kind of money was because we got incredible media exposure. I had friends and, and, and loved ones all over the country calling and texting me saying, you wouldn't believe it. I was in a bar. They had Fox News on. I saw you on Fox News tonight. <laughs> you know, I was in a health club. I couldn't believe it. You were on MSNBC. <laughs> well, when you're in that kind of a race, going after somebody like Wasserman Schultz and it catches fire, that's what helps a campaign go viral. And that's why it hasn't gone viral this year, because the mass media has a blackout. I'm on a blacklist, and I'm on a blackout. And that's what we've got to fight against in these last hundred days. We've got to get this campaign as viral as possible. We need resources. We're trying to do as much as last campaign with less. You know, we have a lot more voters to reach. Last campaign, there were 50, 60,000 folks who voted in a closed Democratic primary. Now it's a general election ballot. It's hundreds of thousands of voters. We were just actually, actually let me tell you this little anecdote. There's a woman in Chicago named Veronica Wolski. She heads Bernie Bridges for more than 800 straight days, going back to April of 2016. Veronica has been on the bridges of Chicago, overlooking freeways with Bernie banners all over the place. And early this year, actually, I think it was right around January 1st when this year started, she started to put on those same bridges over the Chicago freeways, Tim Canova for to the 23rd District of Florida a week ago with her Canova banners, and we spent a week on the bridges over the freeways of South Florida with Tim Canova banners. Yeah. And, and I said, you know, last time we had billboards. This time we don't have the money for billboards, at least not yet. But those bridge signs, that's the poor man's billboard this year. Okay? So, look, I think 
We ran one hell of a campaign two years ago. We've got 100 days to catch lightning in a bottle, and we're going to. And we're going to make sure they don't steal this election. This election is of utmost importance because, again, it pits a corporate-funded incumbent who epitomizes everything that's wrong, not just with the Democratic Party, but our political system, against one of us, a grassroots candidate who's not there to feather his own nest, not there for a career on Capitol Hill. <coughs> we want to go there, and we want to really upset the apple cart on Capitol Hill. It's time for big changes. We, this, is, this talk so far has been all about the politics and not the issues. But go to our campaign website at timkenobi.com. You'll see our issue statements are so well developed. I'm a law professor. I managed not to put footnotes in there. But <laughs> our agenda is your agenda. We want a federal jobs guarantee. Mm -hmm. Any American who wants a job, anyone who lives in this land, should be able to have a job if the, if the, if the, private, sector, if the private sector is not there to supply those jobs, the public sector must be. That's what the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt was all about. Yep. Job for everybody. There's enough work to be done. We have to guarantee it. A basic income for every human being in this country. Health care for everyone. Medicare for all. My opponent, my opponent still has not signed H.R. 676. She still talks about tinkering. The time for tinkering is done. We are in year 10 of a Great Depression for most of this country. This has been a trickle-down recovery. It has been the best of times for the top 1%. You know, you take a look at the top one-tenth of 1%. One We're talking about billionaires, folks that have more money than they can hope to spend if they lived a million lifetimes. And what do they want? More. More, more, more. That's what I mean by losing a sense of your common humanity. Caring for your neighbor. What this country should be about and what it used to be about with my dad's generation, with the greatest generation that sacrificed so much. Our generation has been a free rider generation. Like no other generation in recorded history. We were born into the lap of luxury, born into an infrastructure like no other generation was born into. And we've acted as if it's free. It was handed to us the way air is handed to us. We have forgotten what went into that. All of the sacrifice, the blood, the sweat, and the tears of previous generations. We owe it to future generations to restore what's taken. Restore, renew what we take. our infrastructure to convert from fossil fuels to a sustainable, renewable economy, renewable energy economy. We have the resources to do it. First of all, we need a lot of progressive taxation. Not to, not to pay, and I'll say this, not to pay, not to pay for infrastructure. We need the progressive taxation because there are people at the top that are gaming the system so much. They haven't they're not just buying their fifth yacht and their eighth vacation home. They're regularly buying members of the House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate. That has got to end. We need public banking. We need a Federal Reserve and a National Infrastructure Bank to invest in our future. We need to end the war on drugs, to end mass incarceration. You know, I'll tell you, my opponent, She's something else. I mean, the, 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 the hypocrisy knows no bounds with her. I got to tell you that. Somebody who can preach about democracy while rigging elections. Somebody who takes money from one of the largest private prison corporations in the world and supported a private immigration detention center in my district in Southwest Ranches and now gets on her high horse and talks about what an atrocity, how demonic it is to be separating families, to be taking migrant children and putting them in cages. Yes, it is demonic, and she was for it two years ago. So I'm running out of steam. I want to thank everyone for being here. I've got 
uh, a cousin, a, a, a cousin who's here. He's the young. He might be the youngest guy in the room. Where's Andre? Andre. <laughs> Andre and Keith were there last August of 2016 in South Florida for Election Day. I want to just end by saying this. Two years ago, our campaign was on fire because of all of you. And so many folks from around the country came to my district. So many folks came to my district, and we had the resources to do this, that we rented two houses in the district. They could have made a reality TV show. <laughs> the houses were filled with field organizers who had cut their teeth on the early primaries and caucuses of the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign, and they were in Florida's 23rd, knocking on doors in the Florida heat and humidity. And I was out there with them. I used to say, no matter how hot and humid it got, we had a secret weapon. And that was that I was never going to have a bad hair day. <laughs> we, we need all of you to be part of this campaign. Whatever you can do, whether it's that $17 donation, a $2,700 donation for those of you who have been blessed. Those, if money's tight, whatever you can throw our way. Telephone calls, phone banking. I mentioned we were knocking on 10 to 12,000 doors a week. We were also calling two to 3,000 people. And a lot of those calls were coming from all over the country. We need folks to go to timcanova.com, join this campaign. If you can afford the time to come to South Florida and join me in on the bridges and in the streets and knocking on the doors. Let's make this ground zero for our campaign to restore American democracy. Thank you all so much.